for this week's episode of the Safely Extreme Podcast, where we discuss game design and game dev topics. I am Josh Placer, and join me as always, my co-host from Nexus Games, Sharky. How are you doing? Hello. Um, I'm doing all right. Uh, <laughs> it is a d- daylight savings time, which means everything is thrown off by an hour right now. <laughs> yep. And, and of course, you know, that threw Josh off by even more because, you know, he's Josh. It was still the right. If we were on our normal time, I would be about 40 minutes early. <laughs> Maybe what we should do is do that for the normal, you know, like, like, I think we need to just set your clock back by an hour in whatever mm-hmm. time zone it is. That way you're, you're, you're 40, you know, 10, you're, you're. Anywhere between 10 to 40 minutes early instead of, you know, (laughs) 10 to 40 minutes late. (laughs) (laughs) All right. But uh, we have, once again, another great cast for you this week. We're going to be discussing as our main topic, kind of the basic steps to get started when it comes to crowdfunding a game. From, you know, marketing it to setting up a demo. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And... And this will be, um, you know, not a, you know, not a everything you need to know because I'm in mm-hmm. uh, kind of podcast because, uh, number one, we don't know everything we need to know that you would need to know for your Kickstarter. <laughs> and number two is that uh, the cast isn't going to be that long. I mean, you know, it's certainly going to be long. It's probably going to be two, three hours kind of thing, but uh if we were to tell you everything you need to know, this would be like a, what do you think, about a 20-hour video? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a few TED Talks, too, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we still have a lot to discuss. So just catching up this week, I am in the final stages of my fourth book. I'm at the I Hate Everything I Wrote part, you know, why, and reviewing my entire draft. Why'd you write that stuff? You shouldn't have written that stuff. <laughs> but it is coming out. I think this will be my best book yet, which is also be very awkward to say. It was my third book. It will be out in about a month. So, so, so your next book is inferior. Yes, exactly. <laughs> there's some. There's a marketing tip for you. <laughs> Just insult your work whenever possible, and people will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> but definitely looking forward to book three and finally finishing off book four which is due in about a day or so so after this little discussion i will certainly be doing some work tonight <laughs> a procedural book i think you just gave every author in me on the planet a heart attack there pony <laughs> you need to go for it josh mm-hmm. procedurally write your own book yeah <laughs> yeah, you need the sneezing for effective jump scares or jump sneezes. Jump sneezes. <laughs> I just invented something there. <laughs> I think we invented that a few several streams ago. Yeah. <laughs> but uh other than that, I've been getting in and out of Loop Hero. <laughs> yeah. It's the never ending book. <laughs> It's every time you uh, read it, you you get a different experience. <laughs> Let me pitch that to the publisher, see if they'll go for that one. Yeah. I don't think there's anything like major that we play other than, you know, stuff like Waste Knots. Um, you know, that I would think... actually be a cool 
idea for like a game, a procedural book, but it, it's it's a it's a story based game, and the story you know changes procedurally based off of how you do things mm. or how random gen deals you your cards. Mm. So we kind of like if a uh, helix was taken seriously with like having a procedurally uh, generated text. <laughs> I'm sure I, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, I guess the only like big game I played lately was I attempted to play Total War Three Kingdoms last week, and I respect what they're doing, but it's such a hard game to jump into if you have no idea what's going on previously. I mean, you generally don't know what's going on anyway in any game. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, I've been playing more Cerulean, trying to break the game and get killed at the same time. And I found some more like game breaking stuff to play around with. Next game of the year in the works. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I guess for you, Shark, any new or interesting games you've had a chance to play? Uh, well, we played an interesting one last night. Mm -hmm. uh, what's what's the name of it? Waste. Um... Well, waste and knots. Waste and knots. I play more of Golden Lay and nobody had any idea what was going on there. <laughs> At some point, I keep hearing people talk about the game called Cruelty Squad. It's kind of the so jank that it's good category that I'll have to try and suffer through on a stream. That doesn't that 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 doesn't sound good. <laughs> So jank that it's good sounds like uh, uh, getting over it, which is not good at all. Mm hmm. Yeah. And again, Mojo, if you want a key to check out, if anyone else wants a key to try wasting it, I still have two left. Yeah. All right. Um, but yeah. And again, I'll, we, we need to get Tomo on for another, I think, a jank discussion. <laughs> And we should have our roundtable, I think, next week. This week coming up is going to be busy with the book and everything. But I'm hoping to play all that four. <laughs> mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> uh, oh, and it had in time. We had, well, I played that one originally, but we just replayed it a little bit again this week. Very strong game. But I think at some point we need to have a more concrete chat about the difference is between you know, iterating on an idea and just refining an idea. So I mm -hmm. feel again that a lot of any devs just stop at the refinement part, or sometimes they may not even get that far. Yeah, a lot of them don't. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I got a juicy post for this week coming up talking about kind of what is considered long-term success for an indie dev, and that's going to break a whole lot of. Uh, minds when I say what I think a good metric is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does it keep on making money? Oh, it's beyond making money. Money is the, that's the short-term goal. We're talking about how to grow as a business. No, I mean, like, continue to make money continuously. Yeah. How about procedurally make money? <laughs> One day you earn a dollar, next day you earn a hundred dollars, then you earn two cents. I am able to describe the YouTube way. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean th that that's the way it has been around for the longest time. It's called you take a seed, you take a dollar bill seed, and you plant it in the ground and grow a money tree, yeah. and then it procedurally generates money out to you. Nice. Where do we get money trees from or money seeds? You've got to go buy one. From the Get Good store? Yeah. <laughs> procedurally skipping lunch. <laughs> mm hmm all right, but before we just start on a procedural rant for the next hour, I think uh, let's get to let's get started on our main topic, and that again is talking about how to get started when it comes to crowdfunding. And when we're talking about crowdfunding in this way, we're discussing ways of earning money besides a publisher. So if you get yourself a publisher, this is not a discussion for you. This is for Indiegogo, Kickstarter, I think Fig, uh, Patreon as well. There's and, a bunch of others, too. Oh, yes. 
And like Shark said about five minutes ago, this is not an all-encompassing everything you ever needed to know about crowdfunding. Hey, Mike, because if we did that, one, we should probably get paid for it, not procedurally, and two, it will probably be longer than two to three hours. Mm Mm-hmm. So. What, YouTube doesn't pay us? Uh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Just like in my YouTube talk to a bunch of kids and teenagers, YouTube is not a job. Because if it was a job, we would be getting an hourly wage, which would kind of make things a little bit trigger for game development. Because you get your money, but you usually will get it after the game is done. Ideally, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. But crowdfunding is a very popular option. We could kind of put early access in, but I think that may be a little too much of an exception to, you know, normal crowdfunding for this discussion. Yeah, it's... Early access isn't crowdfunding. Early access is its own thing. Yeah, and as a general tip, if you're waiting for your game to be on early access to crowdfund it, you are in very big trouble. Mm -hmm. So, one of the things that we've been seeing is that this last month or these last few weeks that we've actually had a chance to see some really solid crowdfunding campaigns and crowdfunded based games. Uh, we, Shark and I just played last night Wastenauts, which that is going on early access as of, I believe, the 24th, so or maybe the 23rd. So it's either 9 or 10 days away from the time of this taping. And we also got to play, uh, what was it, the uh, Greatest American Circus, which was another crowdfunded deck build. Let me see if I can get the actual name up. The Amazing American Circus. I'm sorry. And both of these games look to be really solid titles, which the Amazing American Circus, that succeeded on its Kickstarter, and fingers are crossed for Wasting Mm Mm-hmm. And um, they both look like a really solid game, but, you know, what, what is it that we need to know to in order to crowdfund well that's that's a very long list but mm-hmm. what do you what do you think the you know I'm, I'm going to ask this question to you josh what do you think the most important thing to have when you're looking when you're when you're starting your plans for the kickstarter what is the very most mm-hmm. key part of that plan what do you think the very most key part you know i think like Step one, or maybe step negative one, is you need to have something to show people, as mm-hmm. in a play something that is playable. You need to have actual in-game content out there. And I don't think see- it has to be playable, but it mm. it uh, would be good to be playable. But if you if you don't have something playable, have a lot of video, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and whatever you show, whether it's uh, the the playable version or the video, it needs to be highly, highly polished and, and mm-hmm. you know, basically finished content. You know, what you want to do is show off finished stuff mm-hmm. and don't show off the unfinished stuff. Yeah. And, well, I think... Playable is very useful. I think that does help sell a lot of games. You can't be at the stage of your game where you literally don't have code done. The days where you could just make a video saying, I have an amazing idea, give us $300,000 and I'll show it to you, are gone. Yeah. It, <laughs> I wish I had some code right now. Yeah. And... But yeah, I mean, you you really need something going, you know. Mm-hmm. And I mean, here's a question for you, Josh. Do you think I could get away with not showing, you know, not having anything coded because of all my, you know, um, mock up art mock ups? Do you think that would be enough? Hmm. Uh... 
I think that may be stretching things, to be honest. Yeah. I, if I would, if you, if you asked me that question five years ago, I probably would have said yes, or at least give a more positive answer. Mm -hmm. To and I think that's another really big point. Like we always say when it comes to marketing and these kinds of discussions, things change almost on a you know month by month basis. What works for one person may not work for you the next time. And unfortunately, again, it makes it really hard to give definitive answers. But ultimately, I think for right now, you need to show people there's a game here. You need to have something in game that you can show somebody and say, hey, we've actually have, you know, we have code down on our computer. Yeah. Animations. Yeah. Yeah, and to uh, Hammersmith's comment, again, like, top tier for what we want to talk about is you have a playable demo or, you know, a playable build. At least you need to show in-game footage. Like, with the Darkest Dungeon, when they did their Kickstarter, they didn't have anything playable at that time. But they had a really solid proof of concept video, which was all using in-game assets. Yeah. And what was important was those assets were of high quality. You know, mm -hmm. final, finished quality. They weren't showing, you know, placeholder art. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a big thing. You can have placeholder art in your demo. We're not saying don't do that. But if you are making a Kickstarter trailer for your game, you don't want... Temp art. <laughs> Temp art the trailer, like we saw with Ways and Nods in their build. <laughs> well, the th yeah, but y what the difference between having Temp art and having what Ways and Nods has is very different because mm -hmm. what they have is there's a few pieces that are Temp art kind of thing, but everything else is finished. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's different. You know, you know, you don't want. You know, they have, like, finished card art, you know, as in the, the card UI art. They have they finished have the backgrounds. Art done. They have characters done. They have mm -hmm. the only thing that we've seen that they were lacking art-wise in there was the images on the cards and animations for some of them. Mm -hmm. But, like, everything else was done in 100%. And... You definitely want that. You want as many things done in 100%. You want to only leave a few holes in places where, you know, it, it's, it's you know, viable. Because, like, those are only little bitty pictures that when you play them, they become bigger and then animate and all that other stuff. And, you know, but, like, you, you don't want too much temp art. And I think they have the maximum amount that I would, you know, ever suggest for a, like, Kickstarter or mm -hmm. any other kind of crowdfunding. Yeah, and to Pony's comment about banking is pretty far away, and then they're and then they're changing direction, yeah, that's not what you want to do. Also, is my stream okay? I'm getting, like, some hiccups internet-wise, at least according to OBS. <laughs> Art. <laughs> I, I don't see anything. All right. Okay, good. So it's still stable. Yeah. And we've seen developers... Oh, and this is another... We, we may be getting... This may be getting ahead of ourselves. Something about the actual crowdfunding campaign. I think... Let me save this thought for when we get there. Let's stick with, you know, what you want to start with. So... You want to make sure, again, that you have something that is worth showing people. And as soon as I said that, I can see OBS hiccuping again. I'm okay. seeing a buffer, too. All right. Hopefully, it will stay stable here. So, you want, as we said, you want to have in-game footage. You want to have game footage that is credible. And it has to be, as Shark says, as highly polished as you can make it at that time. And I think that's another big point. You want to be or up a path. Yeah, you for like if we're talking about crowdfunding right now, 
you want to be able to show somebody a really solid vertical slice of your game. And again, like, Darkest Dungeon would be kind of the uh, watermark for that, or the high mark example of that. That, but again... Oh, go ahead. If you're going to have a demo, you need more than a vertical slice. You also yes. need a horizontal slice to a point, which would be technically a diagonal slice at that <laughs> point. And isn't it International Pie Day or something? Yeah, it is International Pie Day. So get a get a vertical, horizontal, and and uh, and diagonal slice of yeah. pie. I'm going to have two slices of pizza after this discussion is over. That's not the same kind of pie. We're talking about pi. Pie. Yeah. <laughs> Three fourteen. The date. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Three point one four. You want to be able to show somebody, <laughs> again, enough of your game that they can walk away knowing, what am I paying for? What am I donating my money for this title? <laughs> oh, no, not pineapples. <laughs> yeah, and, you got to have pineapples. Pineapples, pepperoni, and onion. You, you, you'll thank me later. <laughs> Trust me, if do I it. don't, I will really blame Shark on that one. <laughs> do it. You'll thank me later. And ultimately, another reason why you want to have this stuff, or as you're planning your crowdfunding, I think this is another question. When should you start planning a crowdfunding campaign? And this is a very tough question. Some people will start crowdfunding you know, the millisecond they have a game idea, they're already thinking about crowdfunding their game out. Other people may wait until their game is further along. Some may even wait until near the very end and use the crowdfunding essentially, at that point, as a pure-on marketing campaign. As in, whether or not they actually meet the crowdfunding or the Kickstarter goals, they're still making this game. Like, the game is too far along at that point. Yeah. So... Well, that's a there. There's two different things you hit on there. There's the mm -hmm. when do you launch a Kickstarter and when do you start planning it. Mm -hmm. And the answer to when you start planning it at a bare minimum, three months before you're going to launch it, at a bare minimum. Yeah, and again for Darkest Dungeon, they wait. I think at least six months. I think they started to put things together a year before. But they didn't really start to get serious until about six months before the Kickstarter. If you're waiting one week, that is way too short. So you're talking about they pre-plan the Kickstarter, and then they plan the Kickstarter, and then yeah. they launch the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they 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 did the planning of the Kickstarter in at the six-month point, but they did pre-planning before that point, and they did, uh, and then they waited six months after they started planning before they actually released it, and that's. Mm -hmm. That's sort of what I'm doing right now because I'm in the pre-planning process, you know, yeah. online at the moment. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, we'll see how much is left when I get to the planning process because there'll probably be a ton left to do. Mm -hmm. But I'm just trying to get all the idea generation on, you know, like what can we offer as rewards you know what can we do as stretch goals what can we do as oh, this yes. what can we do this what can we you know do here kind of thing and you know just getting the ideas out you know slowly you know over time and then you know you know get everything kind of initially you know kind of set up to where we want to go and then you know go hard at it in the planning phase, the yeah. full planning. And to uh, Hammersmith's comment, yep, and that's what a lot of developers don't like about crowdfunding. That it is like you're essentially working on another game on top of the game you're trying to make, and that you're still trying to get money off of that. Yeah, and and when you when you release the Kickstarter, and it's a month long, expect to be have you know uh the kickstarter be your full-time job for the next mm -hmm. month and expect it to be probably a half-time job from that point forward yep and that's another thing as well 
you're not starting. You're, when you go on Kickstarter, that doesn't mean you're done. You are basically starting a good 30 or sometimes 45 to 60 day month campaign. That means you need to plan out where am I going to update each day? What, what kind of social media am I going to plug? Am I making additional videos? What happens if we meet all of our, what if happens if, you know, luckily us, we hit our goal day one. What do we do now for the next 29 days? Uh, promote those stretch goals. Mm-hmm. Is there going to be an end to our stretch goals? You know, what happens if we want to add more goals? And I guess here's a question for you, Shark. Do you think a developer should plan for these kinds of if, weird situations? Like, what happens if they do hit all their stretch goals within, like, the first week? What happens if they don't hit any stretch goals? Like, should you have contingency plans in place for this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you should definitely mm -hmm. plan. You should plan for your plans. Mm -hmm. You should definitely, you know, be planned up. Uh part of planning for these kind of things is planning to what happens if we don't get funded? What happens if we do get funded? What happens, you know, mm -hmm. if, if funding goes extremely well? What happens if funding goes extremely poorly? What happens if, if we're really close to that line, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's that final one that you just said there is a very important conversation to have because we've seen developers who get just close of their Kickstarter. They don't get enough to get it. And then they will relaunch <laughs> planning plan spiral. Yeah. And they'll relaunch it at a smaller goal. AI Wars by Arkin did that. AI Wars 2. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a few other ones I'm blanking on at the moment. Uh, let's see. Of course, and, there are, you know, crowdfundings that, uh, you know, will, you know, the funding will work no matter if, if the 100% of the goal is achieved or not. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, does, um, I think Kickstarter has a way that you can set that up. I'm not 100% hmm. not sure, though. I yeah, know other sure. platforms do it, you know. I'm not sure about Kickstarter, but like, you know, you can always, you know, if, if set the goal low kind of thing and just aim to get more than the goal. Because like, I mean, you could always set the goal to be $5 or whatever. And... But you need to be really careful with that because I've seen developers who will shortchange their Kickstarter under the assumption that it will go beyond what that goal is. So we'll get more money than what we're asking for. Yeah. And that's then what not happens. What you want to do. And then what ends up happening is it doesn't. And then suddenly your $60,000 plan for a Kickstarter, you now have to do the same amount of content at maybe 25000 Yeah. That, that's not a good idea. You only. You know, the only reason why you would, you know, set one so low is if you can actually do it for that much because you you have every you know you either have everything else done or you know or you you have the ability to finish everything else yeah if you're using your crowdfunding as more of a marketing plug as opposed to you know we desperately need this money for survival you can certainly do that you can set the goals and such as mainly as you know bonus content or you know things we would like to have in this game. But at the end of the day, the game is being made regardless of whether or not we hit our goals. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. And there are developers who will use Kickstarter as their major marketing push, as opposed to their desperately we need money push. Yeah, I'm, I'm using it for your know, marketing push myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, you know, we definitely need money too, but, you know, the the marketing is what we need more of mm -hmm. so that we don't have to spend more money <laughs> that we don't have. 
you know yeah. so you know it's it's uh and of course you know kickstarter alone is not really going to provide quote unquote marketing but Ooh, yes that's a uh that's i think another point we need to elaborate on mm -hmm. that not this is beyond crowdfunding at the moment but it needs to be said when you go onto platforms, whether it's Steam, Itch, Humble, uh, if you're doing crowdfunding, anything like that, the platforms themselves are not your marketing campaign. Nope. And developers will fall into that trap. Mm -hmm. Again, there are people who think, oh, if I put my game on Steam, it will magically get 100,000 copies sold. No, that's not how it works. That's how it used to work about 10, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So again, if you just have that time machine, you'll be set. Yeah. But again, the point for this. Good thing I have one. Good. Well, you better start using it then. Yep. <laughs> the The point about this, the platforms themselves, they don't care about you. They really don't. Steam is not going to cry itself to sleep if your game doesn't sell well and you go out of business. Oh, clap are you sure? I mean... Steam, Steam, Steam weeps tears out of its valves, you know, with the leaky valves, and it's like weeping all the steam out, and you know that steam is condensing into tears, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that these platforms provide you with a space for you to do the marketing, and if you are waiting for the day of your release, the day of your Kickstarter. Any day of release like that to actually start doing your marketing, you basically have, I think, what would we say, like maybe one and a half feet in the grave at that point. I know. You're pretty much six feet under at that point. Mm -hmm. You're pretty much six feet under because uh, you don't need, not only can you not wait until, I mean, if you if you launch and then you start marketing, your your game's already dead. Because the yep. fact is, is so much rides on specifically the, the Steam algorithm to how much you sell in the first day. Mm -hmm. Because what you, how much you sell in the first day influences how much you're going to sell over the next six days in that first week. And then what okay. you sell in that first week determines whether Steam is going to bury you to where nobody could find you even if they search exactly for your, until they 100% mm -hmm. search for exactly your name, every single letter exactly spelled, not just like the first part of your name, you know, like, like, for example, if we made a game called the Safeway Extreme Podcast game, mm -hmm. you know, they could put Safeway Extreme Podcast and still not find it. They could put yep. a space and then G-A-M, they still would not find it. And they could hit that last E, and then bam, there it is. Mm -hmm. And if, if if your sales are so low, if your if your sales are low enough in the first um first uh, week, they will put you like that. They will make it where nobody will find you. The only yeah. people that will find you will people who already know who you are, or and they're name. already going to probably be your fan base, which means. You're not growing out beyond that. Which also means that if they're already your fan base and they didn't buy your game, that means you either just recruited them to your fan base through through marketing, you know, one person at a time, or you your fan base didn't buy your games. And uh Oh that's and that's always good too, right? Yeah. And uh, you know, and but if you already have a fan base, then you're you know at least a large enough one, you know, you're not going to have so much issues with selling enough copies on day one. Mm -hmm. But if if you don't have a large fan base, then that's when you do. So like you know, using the fan base excuse is really not really valid because the fact is is you're not going to have a fan base at that point if 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 you're not selling good enough in the first week then the fan base you have is minuscule if not non-existent to begin with and uh you know i say that as somebody who has a discord of over 100 people when i launched my last game and we only got like 
I think it was nine cells in the first week. So even if they're a part of your community, you cannot count 100% on them because uh, that's that's less than 10%. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, and nine cells on Steam in the first week is a death flag right there. You, yeah. you're, you're done at that point. I'm sure I can count everyone in my Discord to buy, what, like 10 copies of each of my books, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Thousand percent. There we go. Yeah, and like to what Shark just said, like I'm looking at a few of the indie games that were sent to me that were just released. Some of them have like four sales after a week. Some have zero sales after a week. Are you talking about reviews, not sales? Uh, reviews. Yeah. 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 So there's like very little there, and yeah, you need a review score on your first day to have any real shot at, uh, you know, having any kind of success. And uh, it takes 10 to get that. Mm -hmm. Which 10, 10 uh, reviews normally takes about 300 sales in today's oh, yeah. market. Although in, in the market of two years ago, when I released my last game, that was uh, 500, not, not 300. And keep in mind, that's kind of the bare minimum. Bare minimum to even have any kind of fighting chance. Yeah. So, uh, uh, speaking about what Shark just said a minute ago about how the algorithm works, uh, one of the games that Shark and I enjoyed was Rise of the Slime, which is another deck builder roguelike. Mm -hmm. So, for the heck of it, I typed in onto the same search bar, Rise. Doesn't show up at all. I type Rise of the nothing it's still not showing up on the hour because it's not high enough you have to go all the way to rise of the and then s in order for it to show up so the chance of somebody finding that game organically or seem recommending it is minuscule at this point yep and that was a really dang good game and it is sitting at right now 50 reviews on steam mm -hmm. when did it come out about two years ago, October 2019. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. Uh, that that game has felt so hard, and it's it's so sad because that was a really really good game. Mm hmm. Just like uh, other sharks game. Uh, Vision uh, the Sulfur said. Yep. Which let's see. That is sitting at right now. Oh, it went up to 33 reviews. It actually, it was sitting at 10 for the longest time. All of your marketing has, has gotten a few more reviews. Mm-hmm. And how long has that one been out? Uh, since January of 2019, so a little over two years. Mm-hmm. And here's the sad part about this. And this may be getting a little off topic, but I think it kind of needs to fit here. If your game doesn't have at least 100 reviews in two years... It is most definitely a failure. Yeah. Your your game needs 100 reviews in the first week. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't get 100 reviews in the first week, then Steam probably is going to bury you. Oh. I, I, I can't remember what the actual number was, but there was a number um, that seemed official and you know of course steam denied it and everything but there was a number something i think it was something like thirty thousand wish list if you did not hit that number of wish list or something along those lines then the steam was pretty much guaranteed to bury you mm -hmm. because they would bury you based off of the wish list you got before you even started selling mm -hmm. the game and Bringing this back to crowdfunding, one, the biggest thing you have to understand about all this is how momentum works. That once you start doing things right, ideally you'll continue to do things right and you'll continue to build momentum. Mm. And if you do everything properly and things start working out for you, it becomes less likely that you will fail. And again... The thing that I always say when we talk about marketing and these kinds of discussions is that a lot of developers don't understand the work that goes on behind the scenes. They'll mm -hmm. look at a game like Darkest Dungeon or FTL 
or even something like Double Fine, and think to themselves, okay, you know, one day Darkest Dungeon just went on Kickstarter, they got hundreds of thousands of sales, and now they're successful. That's all they did. They didn't do anything else, and Darkest Dungeon just magically became a success. Oh, yeah. You, you know, it, it's that Bioware magic, you know, just, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, you know, take this little, you know, needle here, you know, inject it in your veins, and, and then you have Bioware magic, and you can go, poof, there's a game, poof, there's sales. And Boom. then there's multiplayer. I'm, I'm triple A, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, and and that that that's all you need. It's just a little injection needle. Inject yourself with some of that Bioware magic, and you're good. Mm -hmm. Until you start making weird facial animations and uh, <laughs> and uh, releasing, you know, games like Fallout seventy six, and you know, games like Anthem, and you know, all these other games that uh, supposedly mm -hmm. Bioware magic and other similar magics have failed on. Yep, and if you missed the news, Anthem is now officially kaput. Officially, officially. Mm hmm. Unlike the officially, officially, that was, you know, a few years ago. Yeah. Which is unlike and... the officially, you know, a couple years before that. Mm hmm. And you need to be able to think about things long term if you want to succeed on a crowdfunding campaign. That means. When you're going into it, what am I going to show? How is the page going to look? You know, what's my video going to be? What kind of art am I going to use? You then need to think beyond that. As in, you know, what... I want to stop you here. What? Because I want to stop you here. Um, mm -hmm. Because what goes into making your Kickstarter page, you know, with the, you know, the art you use and all this other stuff... We have a very good example of stuff along that lines, and that would be our other show, Indie Inquiries, where we review mm -hmm. your Steam page. Because, yep. you know, like your Steam page, your Kickstarter page will have similar qualifications. You'll need mm -hmm. good GIFs, good, you know, header images, good, uh, you know, good video, good video, good, you know, trailers, good you know, good, good text. Text broken up, just broken up, headers broken up, none of the stuff, you know, blobbing together. You want everything broken up, segmented, clean, clear, concise. You want the text to be really good, really, you know, and you want to try to make your text as entertaining as possible. <laughs> and you you want to, you know, like, like, you know, watch our other show. It's every Thursday, you know, it. It, it will give you a mind's eye view into that aspect of setting up your Kickstarter page. But keep in mind that, you know, what's required for a Steam page, I mean, like, it's going to be different for a Kickstarter. But, like, a lot of the rules are the same. Mm -hmm. And again, if you're good at one, usually you're good at the other. Mm -hmm. And if you're bad at one, it usually is this like cascading failure effect. Yep, and you know, like we talk in our other show, is you know one of the key things to if you know what cascades through all of them is your art aesthetics. So if your art aesthetics are not in point, then you know your trailer is not going to be on point because it's got those art assets in it. Your thumbnails are not going to be on point. Your screenshots are not going to be on point. Your your Nothing is going to be on point because your aesthetics are not at point. So messing up your your art aesthetics, and I know like a lot of programmers out there who, you know, decide to make a solo game or just like, we'll put mechanics and game design and whatnot into it. And then, you know, it doesn't matter how it looks and we'll put it out. Yeah, maybe 20 years ago, but today, no, absolutely not. You know, your mm -hmm. art aesthetics will penetrate and cause you to fail on your your Kickstarter, your your Steam page, all your different marketing, everything will fall apart. Mm -hmm. And this and to build off of what Shark just said there, this is one of the reasons why when we look at games like Waste and Nuts, like the Amazing American Circus, 
why having that solid beginning or that solid foundation to your design, to your aesthetics, really does matter. It's basically like starting at a plus two advantage for a lot of these successes. If your art is horrible and you or you don't have anything cohesive to begin with, it becomes so much harder to convince somebody to give you money for that. Yeah. I mean, think of it, think of it this way. Here's here's the easy, easy analogy to think about it. Mm -hmm. If if somebody tells you they invented time travel and they take you into their room and they show you a microwave with a few antenna coming off of it and whatnot are you going to be willing to be like yeah yeah you invented time travel let me give you a few million dollars or are they going to need to you know or you know versus somebody who says yeah i invented time travel and then they take you into this giant you know warehouse sized room with things that look way higher tech than NASA ever could dream of, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And at least at this point, and like all kinds of stuff, just going and moving around all these cool, weird things. And it's like, whoa, what the heck is this? You know, it looks like you just walked into not only a sci-fi movie, but a sci-fi movie where things are not like, you know, <laughs> tiny and small, but everything is massive and like fully realistic kind of thing. Like, would you be, which one would you be more willing to, to offer mm -hmm. the, 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 uh, the, all the money in the world to? Well, let me tell you this. What I based that example off of was a little anime called, in, in game, visual novel called Steins Gate. And mm -hmm. they legitimately created time travel out of a microwave. But, you know, the, the, uh, the big one in the that the bad guys had yeah it didn't fully work you know and you know the but the fact is is you would back the bad guys machine because it was it seemed legit and it it, it did do time travel to a certain point but it, it didn't fully do things because it turned everybody into jello after they went through where you know the actual you know little microwave one actually worked but nobody is going to fund the microwave Everybody's going to fund the big, legit, you know, fully, you know, you know, awesome looking one. I, mm -hmm. your art aesthetics have a lot to do with how people think about your game. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how real a thing is, you know, where they had the real microwave working versus the, you know, the <laughs> semi working, you know, giant thing. The fact is, is people aren't going to get behind your microwave. They're going to get behind the giant, you know, sci-fi thing, you know. Even though it works far worse, you know. We see this kind of thing in, like, uh, games like uh, 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 Lazy Bear games. Because mm -hmm. Lazy Bear games, like, their art is so on point. They have such beautiful pixel art where, you know, mm -hmm. and and they sell tremendously. But their gameplay really really lacks on 99 percent of their games and mm -hmm. um a lot of things lack in there just not the art you know where we have seen we talked about it earlier like uh vision soft reset and rise of slime to where they really excelled in the gameplay they were amazing gameplay but like mm -hmm. vision soft reset did not have the aesthetics you know, that a yeah. Lazy Bear game did, because if it did, it probably wouldn't be sitting at, what, 33 reviews now? It'd probably be at no. 3,300, 33,000, 33 million reviews <laughs> by now if it had Lazy Bear art in it. And when you when you present something on Kickstarter, you need to present your Lazy Bear art. Mm -hmm. And uh, to Hammerson's comment, how cohesive does it all need to be? Again, you need to be able to show somebody that you know what you're talking about. If you're putting out a trailer and every image is basically temp art to be done later, people are going to be wondering, what the hell are you trying to do here? No, people are going to be clicking off the page after they see the first one. Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't want temp art anywhere in a trailer. And, you know... And in gameplay, you want it to a very, very minimum. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and your and if you do have a demo or something playable, the core gameplay loop needs to be done. Basically, mm-hmm. I need to know when I'm playing this, what is this game going to look like? You know, a year, five years, six years down the line. And some people may be thinking, well, that just sounds like way too high of a goal. No, that is like the bare minimum. If your core gameplay loop of your demo is fundamentally different than what you're promising in your game, you have a lot of problems coming your way. Yep. A lot of problems. You need you need things as solid and as mapped out as possible, as well as uh, anything that you're not going to run in the final. Unless it's just a tweak to, you know, unless it gets tweaked in the final, you know. Like, you know, like this character, you know, you know, we, we're, he, he's basically done, but in the final, you know, we're changing his hair from, you know, uh, this red color to this other red color kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Or something along that line. Like, like, it needs to be finished art, you know, it doesn't have to be 100% finished art but it needs to be you know 99 percent of the way there kind of thing it needs to be super polished super out there and if people have a problem with the hair color you know and want a darker red or a lighter red then you know change it afterwards but it's final art at that point in time you know because like there's no reason to change it after that point unless there becomes a reason to change after that because people have feedback of you know I think the hair should be a lighter color, you know, you know, I think the hair should be a darker color, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Like, like it should be final product basically, but mm-hmm. not technically. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and yeah, to Hammersmith's comment, what do you consider a temp art? Temp art would be something that you intend to fully replace this. And it is just in your game right now. So you don't have an empty space to it. Yeah, or or something that is a very early version of something you do intend to keep. Yeah. Uh, Slay the Spire would be a good example of this. That during its early access, it had temp art for all the cards in the game, but that temp art was still unique. It was just literally saying temp art, and that was the art. You know, it was like maybe like the agility car was like a poorly drawn foot or a poorly drawn boot. And then when we got to the fish version, you know, it was like me and this character actually like jumping and ducking and weaving on the card. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You again, you want your game to look as professional as possible. And that goes, you know, all that extends to your store page or your Kickstarter page, to how you, you know, talk to people and try to convince them to give you support. Oh, yeah. And absolutely, on your store page, everything has to be final. And if you do a big enough update that changes the look of things, Mm -hmm. you better replace your trailer, your screenshots, and everything else that contains those assets that you've changed. Because the, the key is, I mean, the store page is your last part of your marketing funnel. And what a marketing funnel is, is let's say for example you get somebody and they're they 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 add you to twitter right Mm -hmm. and they're interested enough in your game to now follow your twitter to join your discord now they're on your discord learning more about your game and now they go from your discord to your store page to confirm that they really really want to buy it and then they once they confirm that they hit the purchase button and the thing is, is each one of those steps, they're going from, you know, like intrigued about your game to curious about your game to wanting your game to purchasing your game kind of thing. It's it's that kind of progression kind of thing. And that's what they refer to as marketing funnels. You're, you're bringing somebody along that trip. Yep. And, and each. Uh, but when you get to the final, you know, on the store page kind of thing, this is your final chance. This is the end all be all, you know, will they purchase it or will they not? So you need to throw out the best of everything you have on that store page and the best of everything you have would be your new stuff. So if you have, if you completely redid 
I don't know, like, like twenty mm percent -hmm. of the art in the game, then you want to 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 do that. Like, if, if you do any part of the redo any part of the art or any part of like polish or anything, if you make anything visually look better, not programming, like you know, like you can program whatever you want, and you know, unless it's a brand new system, then you know. It, it doesn't matter, but, you know, and it may not even matter on a brand new system on your store page, because, I mean, you can't really tell too much on your store page. I mean, you can certainly update it in the description down below in the About This Game page, and maybe provide a screenshot or a GIF down there, but you probably don't need to update anything in your trailer or GIF, but you may, depending on what it is. But the fact is, is that you need that latest art the latest polish the latest whatever on your store page in your top area with your screenshots your trailer all that because like mm -hmm. in our other show we talked about you know that you know your your the it goes down in order your thumbnail is the most uh the one that gets you onto that store page unless it came directly into um the uh unless again directly from your discord kind of thing and then they're going straight to your trailer mm -hmm. then you got your trailer and then you've got your screenshots and then the about this page and then and maybe then... they'll go you know to other stuff after that but you know that's the the key kind if of you... order yeah if you can hook them at step one they're not going to stick around for step five mm -hmm. and this is again like another big point like to what Shark said about these kinds of sales funnels is that each time you're asking somebody to go somewhere else, that is another hoop for them to jump through. And people don't like jumping through hoops for stuff. So you need to make sure that each one of these things is as polished and as amazing as you can. And if you're not, you can lose them. So if let's say, for instance, that you want to do Let's say you're trying to get someone to visit your page on Kickstarter and support you. So you make a Facebook tweet. And the Facebook tweet looks horrible and, you know, you use broken text. There's The link doesn't work. Well, nobody's going to click on your Kickstarter. And you need to be able to make sure that everything that you put out or you officially put out. Again, posting you know, something on you know, Screenshot Saturday on Twitter is not the same as having on your official store page. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that everything that you consider to be official is as highly high quality as you can make it. If, if sure, if you remember that game from that any developer that submitted to the store page that he got like a massive UI update, and the thumbnails on the store page haven't been updated yet to represent that. Oh, that wasn't a massive, I mean, it was just one thing, but it was one very critical thing that repeated everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, you want your game, you want everything that you do to be as high quality as possible. Because if it doesn't, then you are losing fans somewhere along the line. This is why when I do marketing for Game Wisdom, that I stick with technically YouTube, the main site, Medium, and Twitter. Because those are the four places where I'm the strongest at. If I want to add, you know, Facebook, Instagram, all the other stuff the young kids are using these days, it begins to dilute that for me. Now, maybe someday, if I had, you know, people working with me and a marketing team, yes, I can do all that. But if I can't consistently put out a standard of quality everywhere that I'm promoting myself, that I'm shooting myself in the foot. Yeah, don't you want TikTok though? I don't even know what TikTok is. Well, that's that sounds like a young person thing. <laughs> Old man Josh. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, you absolutely need every part of your funnel to be, you know, of the best quality. And you know, Kickstarter is part of that funnel. You know, whatever crowdfunding you use is part of that funnel. Mm -hmm. because you know you're funneling from the kickstarter to the store page and some people and you're funneling, funneling from, from somewhere else into kickstarter yeah 
Some people may do as the opposite. They may have a store page and say, okay, coming soon to Kickstarter, click here. And yeah. this is why you want everything to be high quality because at the end of the day, most of you will never know where your fans come from. They may follow you on Twitter. They may have come to your Discord because, because some random person said, here, go to this guy's Discord. You're going to like what he has to say. They may find you on some random video you put up on Instagram. You never know. And this is why whenever I get people who join me who just say, you know, I found you on some random article, I generally like to ask them, where did you find me on? Some of them have found me from Gamma Sutra, Medium. Sometimes I'm even being cross-posted to, like, sites in China that people are finding me on this. Exactly, Amir. This video is part of it. Or this, this live part, stream. This, this video is part of my funnel. Speaking of part of my funnel, let's 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 go into this and and direct you to the next part of the funnel. The next part of Monty Josh's funnel is Josh has his Discord on his side of the funnel, mm -hmm. and I have my Discord on my side of the funnel, and we also have both of our YouTube channels that are part of our mm -hmm. funnel. So subscribe, yeah. lick the smash button, smack the lick button, and join the Discord. Yeah, for both and of us. This is a procedurally generated video right now. It's a video happening in real time, <laughs> a.k.a. a podcast. <laughs> We're just inventing all kinds of stuff today, aren't we, Shard? Like, yeah. We need to copyright this. Yeah, we, we need to smash the, the copyright button. <laughs> and it's right after. next to the make multiplayer button. Yeah. <laughs> and... When you're trying to get people into your various content, again, quality matters. Uh, we what's our cold personality? We have well, like ten ten uh, cultists right now. What are we <laughs> <laughs> but this is why you need to be really careful what you put out there, because if somebody find because somebody will always find your worst content. That will be the very first thing they look at, and they will judge everything else you've done on that one horrible piece. Which is exactly the reason why you need to be very careful about what you post to anything that Google will pick up. You Ooh, know, yes. because Google will pick up the oldest thing and list it <laughs> under images for your game. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's one reason why I like keeping a temporary name, a project name, you know, called my current one project tried for the longest. And now it's officially got its name of Neon Continuum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, therefore anything that's linked to Project Triad will not necessarily show up when you, it'll probably show up when you search Neon Continuum if you scroll down far enough, but it won't show up at the top result. You, you'll see stuff that is under Neon Continuum, which I've only posted, you know, polished stuff. And I've also only, you know, tried to post as many th things that do not go on uh, Google kind of thing. Like, like mm -hmm. you post videos, YouTube videos and whatnot, live streams, you know, videos, and you're only going to find thumbnails and such like that on there and that's all highly polished and everything and custom to that video kind of thing rather than you know actually part of you know the game itself mm -hmm. you know you yeah. only see about the game inside of that video which you know google is far less going to pick up on if if mm -hmm. at all yeah and it is very tough when you're trying to market your stuff like this because you need to get the word out there Ideally, as soon as you have something you want to show people. And this is something that I say to a lot of developers who submit games for the weekly in these showcases. That when they send me something, I say, are you comfortable with me showing this off? Because this, whether you like it or not, is going to become part of your search algorithm. Unless you do like what I did. What was that? Unless you do like what I did and have the project name. Yeah. Because yeah, but, Josh showed off a video of Project Triad and in the initial form, which and that will, and it, that was not aesthetically pleasing, but it was really solid gameplay. I think, wasn't it, Josh? Mm -hmm. You tell me. It was totally pay to win, though. <laughs> and and to build off of that, if somebody searches Neon Continuum on YouTube. 
they're not going to find that video for a very obvious reason. It, there's nothing linking Neon Continuum to that Project Triad video. Mm -hmm. Now, if I were to go back there and change it, you know, and say, you know, this is the pay-to-win horrible version of Neon Continuum, that would be a different story. Even, but that would still depend on YouTube's algorithm picking that up. Mm -hmm. So you need to, again, be very aware of what people are seeing. Now, in today's market, like, again, if you send me your game and it is a horrible looking game and I make a video about it, people are going to find that when they search for it. And if in some strange situation I'm bigger than you, my stuff is going to come up first. And people aren't going to see your amazing complete art redesign that you did if it's 50th on the list. Mm hmm. Or even like, you know, 10th, because you won't be on the screen. They'll have to scroll down. They'll, you know, which there's like 10 or so videos they can see before that, which mm -hmm. by, the, you know, probably the first or second one, they've probably seen enough. Mm hmm. And yep, that is always that nightmare about this. You are either in the top five, we could say, or you are a millionth compared in other people's minds yeah if you're not in top five you don't exist which is exactly the reason why you know this is a separate topic but this is exactly why you can't you know grow fan base on on twitch because people will the people who know will scroll all the way down to the bottom and find new streamers and whatnot and support them but they'll when as each one of them supports you You'll go higher and higher off that list. But once you get just far enough off the bottom, nobody new shows up ever mm -hmm. again. And, um, you know, but if you already have a sizable audience and you go to tw your Twitch and everything, and then it will just, you know, shoot you through the roof and you'll grow out, out the, the yin-yang yeah. kind of thing. You're, you know, it, it amplifies what you have. And it buries if you don't have anything. So, yeah. you know, and this comes to, you know, and this is relevant because this is part of your marketing that, you know, and part of your, your funnel that will go to your Kickstarter. Because if you're doing a Twitch stream to tell people about your, your Kickstarter or whatever, <laughs> then, you know, if you're, if you don't already have a fan base, then you're not going to go anywhere on your twi Twitch, which means that your Kickstarter is not going to have any input from Twitch, basically. Yeah. And this, again, is one of the things I learned when I, was, when I do my Patreon, that my Patreon definitely has not grown as high as I wanted. And part of that problem is that I put out my... The Patreon went up, I think, like 2013, 2014. That was a very, very long time ago before even I had any close amount of fans. And... Like Shark said, everything amplifies everything else around it. If you have a really solid Kickstarter, it should drive traffic to your store page. If you have a really attractive store page, that should attract people to your Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. And all this stuff is meant to amplify. And it, this is it's one a of bunch reasons. of snowballs. It's it's a yeah. snowball effect. And you know, if you 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 need one snowball to amplify the other. And if if you have if you have a yellow snowball, you know, yeah. because it's somebody somebody did something to that yellow snowball, you know, that I can't say on YouTube. If if you have that yellow snowball, then then mm -hmm. that's gonna turn people off. They're not gonna to want to touch that yellow snowball and they're gonna be out, you know, where you may have a pristine white snowball somewhere else. And people will be definitely interested in that one. But if they get. if they go if they follow that white snowball and they get to the yellow snowball, then they're going to be turned off and leave. You know anybody who gets to that yellow snowball, whether they start there or transfer from you know somewhere else, they're going to leave probably most likely, most guaranteed, almost one hundred percent, probably like ninety nine or something. I don't know what the actual percentage would be, but it would be a very high percentage of people that would leave once they encounter that yellow snowball. Yeah, and, and that's what you need to be aware of, and make sure that you don't have any yellow snowballs in there. Don't demod into your snowball. 
Mm -hmm. And this is why when we talk about marketing in all aspects, that hey, I'll go to, that a lot of developers fail to learn these lessons. That they'll look at big name successes on you know Kickstarter, on Steam, on Home, whatever, and they'll think that they did nothing to earn it. Or if I just copy Darkest Dungeon, my game will get 50,000 reviews and 100,000 copies sold, and I'll be successful. It's the mm -hmm. same thing with the whole World Warcraft MMO bus. If I just copy World Warcraft, then the marketing is done for me, right? Yeah. If, if I'm if I'm a you know solo indie developer, then I can obviously do the same thing uh, Stardew Valley can do. You can make a No Man's Sky as a solo developer, right? Yeah. Absolutely. 1,000% sure, you know, that uh, you can't. <laughs> Yeah, and the point about this is that a lot of people, when they look at these successes, they see the result. They don't see the work that goes into it. And when developers put in this work, as Shark just said, it is the snowball effect. And YouTube, Steam, Google, they love, their algorithm absolutely loves to see continued success. Because if you're successful, it means they're going to promote you more. If they promote you more, it means you're going to succeed more. And if you succeed more, guess what? They're going to keep promoting that. Yep. And it's why we use that term, you know, the rich getting richer in this aspect. That if you have an amazing, fantastic, oh my God, this is the best damn Kickstarter anyone has ever seen, most likely that's going to translate into a really solid Steam sale. And those really solid Steam sales are going to translate into more success. Yep. And success the, um, begets success. Yeah. And this is why when we look at developers who continue to succeed, it is very hard for them to fail. Clay Entertainment, even with their quote-unquote lesser selling games like Invisible Ink and Hot Lava, still did really well compared to a lot of other indie games out there. Yeah, it, if, if those games came out before they were really successful and everything, those games story. would have probably felt pretty horribly. Yeah, it's why uh, when we look at Darkest Dungeon that I, at this point, I don't need to hear one damn thing about Darkest Dungeon 2. I can predict it is going to be a very successful game. If we look at, like, Dyson Sphere, for instance, uh, as kind of like the first shot from this studio. Wait, which side is low? Minor dressers. Also, to your, your crow fund question, I mean, why would you want to fund crows? I mean, like, they, 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 you know, you, you generally want to chase away, you know, that's the reason why you get a scarecrow, you know, chase away the, the crows, not, not, yeah. you know, I mean, like, unless unless there's some kind of, you know, unless they, the the crows gain sentience and they come at you like uh, like the mob or something, it's like, hey, give me some money, protection money, or or else we we're not going to leave you alone. It's, accidents yeah. will happen, you know. That's the only point where you want a crow fund. Yeah, like if we look money. at something like Dyson Sphere, for instance, that for Dyson. Uh, coming out, it already has 30,000 reviews. That game and that studio has some amazing momentum going forward. You want, and like we said, you want to keep this momentum going. If your Kickstarter succeeds, you want to promote the hell out. And if your game does really well, you want, Pete, you want to shout that from the rafters, that People want to know about this. And as we've said, there should not be a weak link in that chain. If your Kickstarter is amazing, your Steam store page is amazing, and your Twitter promotions are horrible, you basically just took a hammer to your kneecap there. Yep. Now then, uh, to what El Gordo says, I don't think there's any way that I can change the volume as a whole, other than 
moving your volume slider up. You could. I think I have yours somewhat high. No, no. He's talking about the whole stream. Oh, they're just raising. You probably have to raise up your volume, my volume. Yeah, but right now they're already close to peaking. Yeah. Always the fun, I know. Yeah, my voice is like right on the edge of yellow. And I'm afraid if I make any lower, then I start being like whisper level. Yeah, mine's right on the edge of red. Mm hmm. <laughs> Again, I don't trust anybody. You know, the. You know, we won't have people watching us right now. It's just all bots. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we could say whatever we want right now, and nobody would stop us. We could say, you know, that uh, that uh, the Earth is flat, and I can prove it. There's a game called Eco, and you can go around the Earth, and you can dig all the way down to the bottom, and th th you can prove that's flat, even though it looks round. <laughs> Wait, so real life isn't like Minecraft? Nope. I mean, it, it is. It is. I mean, my... And uh, to Will's point, I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, that wherever you kind of, you know, plant your flag in terms of social media, you need to do that really well. Like, for me, I'm really debating just canceling my Facebook because I really don't use it all that well. And I know people generally tend to find me on there from time to time, but I just don't have the time to really dedicate to it. So that's why I focus on Discord, Twitter, Medium, YouTube. Yeah, and I focus on Discord, uh, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Because mm -hmm. the way I see Facebook is I can just take my same exact uh, you know, tweets that I make on Twitter, post them there with some slight edits, and it's good. Mm -hmm. But like we've said, ultimately... Wherever you want to, wherever you are promoting yourself, you want that to be the best possible version. Mm. Don't, wherever you're going, don't half ass it. If you're not comfortable with Instagram, don't just, you know, put stuff up like your C uh, squad, your C level material on Instagram. Yeah. You need to whole ass it, is what Josh is saying. Exactly. Don't half ass it, whole ass it. You can't whole ass it. You need to haul ass. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think if there's any any other major points we haven't discussed yet, Shark. Uh, let me think here. Um, well, we haven't talked about anything like specific, like rewards, you know, um, mm -hmm. goals, um, um, the uh um well yeah that's rewards yeah so i think to uh to kind of talk about that and again this is probably too big of a point and we're not experts in like the marketing logistics side to get too far into it but it does need to be said when you're planning out your crowdfunding you need to look at how everything is going to work in this aspect as in, uh, let's start with stretch goals first, and then we'll go to rewards after that. Mm -hmm. With stretch goals, you need to be thinking about how is this going to affect my development pipeline? Because it will. And one of the surefire ways to completely ruin your game is to overpromise on your stretch goals. Not just overpromise, but undersell their value. As in, okay, I my game is going to cost me hundred thousand. That's going to be our main goal, and then for hundred and five thousand, I'm going to add fifty more hours of content, because surely I can do all that with just five grand, right? Oh yeah, that that's that's really easy. All you got to do is skip lunch. Mm hmm. Skip lunch, and or, you're good. Or you'll say to yourself, okay, our goal is going to be at hundred thousand. Let's have 75 more stretch goals at $3,000 a pop. And I'm sure we can just do all that in the same span of time. Yeah. Probably not. Depending on what the stretch goal is. I mean, like, mm -hmm. if, if it's adding a character and your characters are really easy to add, you know, then maybe, yeah. 
but if it's kind of like we're going to add in 80 new classes with all custom art and animations with completely unique design on top of that that will all be balanced together not so much yeah and you would also have to worry about having all those characters and classes and not making them feel samey. Mm-hmm. Just make a disguise on ten thousand dollars. It'll be easy. Well, uh, technically, I kind of already did that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to Will's comment about demos, I feel like that could be its own topic. That may be a little too big to get into here. What do you think? Well, we can talk about demos to a small degree. Just a mm-hmm. little highlight, and you know, because we've already had our demo talk before mm-hmm. uh, on uh, last uh, later an uh, earlier podcast of the Safe Way Stream podcast, but like you know, we can hit on one thing that you're you need to be your foot best foot forward. If you have your best foot forward in a demo, then then you're good mm-hmm. as long as you know. As long as your best foot forward is good enough, anyway. Mm-hmm. If your if your best foot forward isn't good enough, then everything's going to fall apart, no matter what. It's yeah. not going to be the demo that caused you to fall apart. It's going to be that was your best foot forward, and it wasn't good enough, and everything else is definitely not good enough. So mm-hmm. you 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 your best foot forward has to be good enough. And we talked about many ways that that applies, but you know, if if it's not your best foot forward, then then why are you doing fundraising? You know. Yeah. And to kind of get back to like, like the stretch goals and the rewards, these are all things you need to be planning out way in advance. Like when you are sitting down and you know actually writing up your plan for a crowdfunding campaign, you need to be able to answer the questions okay what's my goal what are my stretch goals if i have any where are my rewards how am i actually going to facilitate these rewards and that is a huge point when we start talking about logistics of manufacturing you're going to have physical goods are they going to be digital goods will there be a limit on them another thing that i see some developers do that tends to backfire is have kickstarter exclusive content that actually changes the game yeah, I mean it's okay to have Kickstarter exclusive content, but it can't be Kickstarter exclusive game content. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, because like the key ring or whatever that you give away on Kickstarter is not going to affect the gameplay of mm-hmm. your game unless it's a me amiibo kind of thing, and then it will. But you know, you know, yeah. out, outside of you know stuff like that, they won't. You know, don't don't do anything like that. Yeah, don't, like, promise your Kickstarter, here's an exclusive game system that will not be available in the r- retail version. Yeah, that would not be good. Mm-hmm. You can promise that, you know, that here's a game system that will get added in if we reach this goal. Yeah. But don't, don't make it exclusive. Yes. And again, you need to be really mindful about this. You also, in some cases, you may also need a plan. What happens if people want to buy the stuff after the Kickstarter is over? What happens if, let's say, your very cool biker jacket that you got 100,000 copies manufactured, what if there's 50,000 more people who want that? What if there's five people who want that? You need to have to think about what all this means going down the line. And, and let me let me give you my my thoughts on that jacket. Mm-hmm. Is I would not do any more of those jackets because mm-hmm. the fact is is that is a Kickstarter exclusive jacket. Now, on the other hand, I do like money, mm-hmm. and I I need money to keep my studio alive. So what I would do is make a small change to the jacket, like put a emblem or something barely noticeable just put a tm at the bottom trademark you know mm-hmm. whatever it is you know not you you can't legally do that i feel like i need to tell you that but unless you do actually get a trademark but like do mm-hmm. something small a small change you know and then sell those as many copies as you want 
mm-hmm. as many copies as you can, you know. But keep the exclusive version exclusive, you know. You know, think of it about like a toy manufacturing, you know. Um, mm-hmm. For the longest time, you know, there was misprints <laughs> on uh, Ninja Turtle uh, named Slash, you know. They gave him a purplish pink, you know, bandana. And he was supposed to be black. The show was black. The 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 everything was black except for the toy. And then they all of a sudden sweat swapped and started calling her black. And you know now that red one, the the reddish pink purple one, is is a collector is a special collector's item because it was an exclusive to the. To the Kickstarters, basically, they got that special misprinted version. Essentially, you know, like mm-hmm. it's different and and it it is wholly unique to the people that got that. And that's how you know the Kickstarter version should be. It should be wholly unique to them because mm-hmm. last thing you want to do is take a crap on your 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 Kickstarter people that made you the seed and you don't want to punish somebody for not finding you uh six months a year even five days after the fact because yeah. again no matter what you do people aren't going to find you immediately and you don't want to basically say hey your reward for finally discovering my game is you don't get to play 100 percent of it you know screw you yeah but you know, you can do that with physical rewards, but you know, maybe have a, you know, maybe be able to sell a different version of that physical reward later if there is enough demand to do that. You know, like if it's just one or two people kind of thing, then yeah. the manufacturing cost is probably not worth it there. But you know, if and- if there's a few hundred or something, or you know, on a leather jacket, probably less than a few hundred. But you know. You know, and something you can make legitimate money on of, you know, make a different version of it and sell it. You know, leave it mostly the same, but, you know, uniquely different. And some developers I know, when they do their initial printing, they will go over the amount of promised copies that have a reserve. So that, let's say it sells, let's say we have 50,000 uh, Kickstarter pledges for this visible good, maybe we'll print 60, 65,000 and have that as a backup so that in case something gets damaged or if let's say people really like it, we can say, okay, limited time only, you know, we have 15,000 in stock and if you want it, buy it, but after that we're done. Mm -hmm. And you can say that when it comes to some of these goods. Like you say to yourself, okay, we have a limit of 30,000 of these bonus things. When that's done, you know, our hands are washed of it. So get it now or not. Now, if it's a digital good, that's a little different. I think Shark's example of, you know, tweaking it slightly can help. Like what they did with Darkest Dungeon, where the Kickstarter skin of the Musketeer, that is forever exclusive to them. But if you want the musketeer variant that's the kind of a similar thing yes you can spend two three dollars for that skin well i wouldn't even do that in a digital i would just you know sell it digital you know i would never have it exclusive to to kickstarter i'm just talking about making it different for the physical stuff Mm -hmm. because like you know everybody got this limited edition you know uh leather jacket kind of thing now they can get the unlimited edition that looks basically the same, but slightly different, you know. Now, same you as, know, is that safely extreme? No. <laughs> it's more safely safe. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's, you know, like, like say you're, you're making a game about vampires. Let's say it's a Castlevania, you know, leather jacket kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it has, like, five bats in the background. Well, you, you when you make your you know you do that as your exclusive for your 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 um, Kickstarter, and then for the you know once all those sell out and everything, then you can go to a unlimited version, and now it has a six bat in there, or maybe it just takes away one of the five, and now you have four kind of thing, 
I mean, you have five black bats. One of them is green or blue or yeah. whatever. Or maybe all the bats just slightly change color instead of being blackish purple. Now they're blackish blue kind of thing, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and yeah. it, it will look very much like the same jacket, but it will technically be different and will be exclusive to the Kickstarter. And, you know, because you don't want to on exclusive, exclusive thing. But you can give, you also don't want to screw out a lot of people who, you know, want that and willing to give you money for it, for yeah, for and- that kind of thing. And here's another thing, you know, that, that really gets me on, you know, that basically make sure you know the prices of everything. Make sure you know that this leather jacket Ooh, yes. is going to take you, cost you, you know, $100 per thing to, to make. And you consider that and be like, okay, well, we need to set the Kickstarter goal to get this jacket at $300 or else we're going to lose money. uh, Also, don't forget about shipping. Yeah. Because shipping and logistics is a major point about this. And ultimately, like, here's, like, the biggest tip you can get when it comes to starting out crowdfunding. One second. Voice is done just before I gave the big tip. Do research. You need to understand what the market expects. You need to understand what these prices and stuff will cost. And again, you need to have that sit down discussion and say, what exactly do I need? And it's not just saying, I need a lot of money. You need to be able to sit down and say to yourself, can we make this game with 150,000 additional revenue? Can we make it on 75,000? What does a three hundred thousand dollar a three hundred thousand dollar reward or Kickstarter look like for our game? Because mm-hmm. you need to plan this stuff out. You should not be confused. You should not be, you know, wishy washy when it comes to what all this means. Because if you don't think about the stuff, it will come back to bite you. Yeah, and you need to have everything planned, and you know need and you also need to figure out not only how much you need and whatnot mm-hmm. but how much are people willing to actually give you yeah and that is a far harder number to figure out definitely and again it's one of the things that kickstarter or i've seen developers have to adjust that they'll say my amazing idea i just need five hundred thousand dollars for it but Let's say your fans will only support you up to $200,000. What do you do then? You got to figure out a way to make your game $300,000 cheaper while still not getting rid of any of that won't. And, Mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, this doesn't just apply to Kickstarter. This applies to game dev as a total because Mm -hmm. you need to try to, you know, spend less than what you're going to make. Yep. and. That is a topic, that's a whole nother topic to get into when it comes to having to balance the game you want to make versus the game people are actually going to buy. Mm-hmm. And because if you break even on. Mm-hmm. And even with Kickstarter, if you're managing your the funding that you want, you also need to give yourself a little bit of a bubble. Because as sure as I know you're well aware of, game development is 100% consistent. If you say it will take five months to do it, it will take exactly five months to the second to get that done. Oh, yeah, exactly. Things never get done in four months, 29 days, and 29 seconds. It also mm-hmm. never gets done in five days and one second. Never never happens. It is like clockwork. You know, Every, people, no, people are no. as accurate as the, you know, crystal clocks on the wall you you you've never found a you know person that is not right to time or like 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 a masochist that you know is late to all the streams that 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 never happens all you have to do is if you put it in your google calendar the google will magically make everything work to that time oh is that google magic and not bioware magic yeah (laughs) <clears throat> oh, my voice is really dying now. But I do need to get going in the next few minutes. So I guess we, well, we begin... now have the rewards to talk about or the uh, the uh, 
because I mean, we we kind of did a little bit of the rewards already, but we haven't do- di- dived into them. All right, this will be our final point then, and then I do need to get running for tonight. So, so what can we look at for rewards? You know, you have mm-hmm. like stickers, you got like pins, you got you know leather jackets, you've got you know, t-shirts. Art. What was that? Concept art. You could sell them. Yeah, you got posters, postcards, mm-hmm. pins, um, anything that you pins. can put a price tag on, you can try and sell. Coffee mugs, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, you know, may- maybe that's what I should do. Is it a Neon Continuum coffee mug, you know, where, you know. So bright it blinds you when you're trying to wake up in the morning. It, it'll, it'll have, like, stuff in there that as you, as you, as you pour coffee in it, it heats it up and that causes the neons to glow. Mm-hmm. That won't cost any money to manufacture. No. <laughs> and you want to be as cost effective as you can with these goals for two reasons. One, it'll help your bottom line if you can make something very cheap that you can earn money on it very easily. Mm-hmm. And two, it will allow it will be far more attractive to the consumer. You know, a t shirt that will cost ten thousand dollars, most people aren't gonna spend that money on no matter how much they like you. I mean I would. Mm-hmm. I mean it's 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 a t shirt. Mm-hmm. I mean that that's gotta be worth ten million dollars. Of course. But you also need to keep in mind that, you know, these sites and everything that you use to get these goods from. They generally charge you more for less quantity. So yep. you need to be sure that at any quality that you're going to get, you're going to at bare minimum break even because mm-hmm. what happens if you you know, set up this Kickstarter or this funding thing and you know you don't make your goal but you you still get funded to the you know to a lower extent say you get like you know you're going for $100,000 worth of funding and you got a thousand and then when you when you calculate all you need to do to send off all the stuff it is going to cost you ten thousand dollars to do you know you're going to have to crowdfund to get that nine thousand dollars to send your rewards to the to, <laughs> to the people you've already done you need to do a crowdfunding campaign to support your previous crowdfunding campaign and then you got to do another one to actually support your game because that there's nobody for the game at this point yeah it's all going into that. So be careful about those minimum orders. And this is why a lot of developers who aren't familiar, who aren't expertise in physical goods, they'll just stick with digital goods because you can just hit a button and, you know, get 50 copies of it. Mm-hmm. But the issue with digital goods is when you, when they're not exclusive, they're, they're not as appealing to the, mm-hmm. to the user base. And when they are exclusive, then you're walling off content from your your other players that find you later, and that's bad. And people are going to hate you for that. Mm-hmm. And again, part of the challenge of doing this is you have to make sure to not piss off people. Mm-hmm. And if you do it the way Josh was just saying, you're going to piss off people. Mm-hmm. Now, you're going to do it the way Dark Souls de- or uh, not Dark Souls, uh, Darkest, Darkest Dungeon. Dungeon did it and, you know, make a different version of an exclusive thing and sell that. Mm-hmm. But, like, you know, the fact is, <laughs> is if it's just a little bit of difference in, in a digital good, that's probably going to make still make some people mad. Yeah. And you have to really sit down and plan this out. Oh, thank you, Chris. And if you don't, again... It will come back to haunt you no matter what. And one of the things that's always great is to see developers who plan this out in advance and say, okay, if we sell this, we're selling, you know, 50,000 exclusive versions, but then we'll have another version on sale. And another reason why you want to do this is that it shows professionalism. It shows to people that you're not just some, you know, you didn't just, you know, hobble the, or cobble this together in a day. You planned this out. You you have an answer to every question that somebody wants to ask you. Too many people have hobbled it together in a day. And yeah. Chris, I hope you got your chocolate milk ready. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. What they did was they had a Kickstarter exclusive skin for a character, and people wanted after the fact. And because they didn't plan that out in advance, it left them in this very weird state. And they eventually settled on releasing a another version of that that they sold as kind of the retail version of it. Mm -hmm. It was a slightly different version of that skin. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some of the people who got the exclusive was not happy about that. Yeah. But again, they they did a lot of talking behind the scenes of their backers to mm -hmm. find the best way of going forward. Yeah. But again, ultimately, if you can get all this stuff figured, oh no, not out chocolate milk. <laughs> if you can get all this stuff figured out during the planning stage, and just like with game development, it will make things smoother along the lines. Mm hmm. And you need to, you know, map out everything. You know, map out all the money that's going to be going out to the expenses to buy whatever it is you're buying, pens, you know, whatever, posters, all that mm -hmm. stuff. And map out, you know, like, I, I don't know how, how much it costs to, 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 you know, print out a poster. So I'm just going to throw out some numbers here. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it costs to, to, to map out some pens. But let's just say that it cost um, 50 cents per pin, right? Mm -hmm. For, you know, like a pin that you pin on your jacket or whatever, not like an ink pin. Yeah. And and say that it cost, you know, 40 cents to do a print out of a, a decent sized poster, like a, maybe like a 20 by 20 inch poster kind of thing, nothing massive kind of thing. And, you know, then you've already got, you, 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 you either already got art to put on that poster or you can have your artist pay them to make it, you know, and you got to figure out what costs more kind of thing to you. And then you got to figure out what is more valuable to your consumer base, because, you know, maybe the cheaper thing to you is the more valuable thing to them, which doesn't mean that you should you should charge based off of what they want to pay for it versus what what is valued to them not how much it's costing you because like you could have like your top tier thing you know be the cheapest thing it is to make for you kind of thing yeah and you never know really what people are going to resonate with you could plan this super amazing $600 I don't know, diorama set for your game. Nobody buys that, but they all fall in love with this like $40, you know, plushie you made of one of your characters. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and part of that would be getting feedback and everything off of prototypes of merchandise with your fan base. Mm -hmm. So when you when you're when you're getting ready for this, you need to do a few one run prints of you know these different things and you know figure out and and take or them to your fan base or show them like concept art or approval concepts of what you're planning mm -hmm. i know with like a few people they'll put up like you know a prototype version or concept art of a figurine they may want to include in a tabletop game and see if people resonate with this yeah but you you need to you know, maybe that's the first step, but the second step would be you actually get a a actual a real version version of it, mm -hmm. and you know because like I mean that's not all that expensive compared to you know what it will be because like for example like if if I were to go print out like a uh, like a deck of cards kind of thing, you know, mm -hmm. I could print that out. I think one copy. I think I could print it out like. 15 bucks or 20 bucks or something along that lines mm -hmm. where if I order like a few thousand, then I can get them for, you know, probably like a dollar a piece or something like that. Yeah. But again, you don't want to order a few thousand. If nobody, you have no idea if anybody wants to even buy it. Yeah. That's and, the reason yeah, why you buy the one once you get to that point and then you see how people respond to that one and mm -hmm. how wanted it is. And you do that, you compare that to everything else. Because, like, maybe you make, you you actually go and do this, like, you know, 
on like 30 different products kind of thing. And you mm-hmm. find out that 10 or 15 of them are completely useless to you, or maybe even more than that. And like, you know, like, you know, maybe five or so are high cost and not really wanted. But like these like seven here are like everybody wants them. And, you know, most of them are low cost and some are marked. You know, yeah. and you just never know. Mm-hmm. And I know manufacturers will print out like test runs or, you know, give you a sample run just to see if this is what you want. And you can use that as kind of like the first step. Now, you again, every manufacturer, and again, we're kind of focusing exclusively on physical goods for right now. Every manufacturer is different. Mm-hmm. Some, you may have somebody who can do this amazing thing. For it could be half the cost of another manufacturer. But maybe that other manufacturer could get you those products uh, one and a half times faster. And you need to weigh all this stuff in. Yeah. Because if you don't, you could have that situation of this is a horrible looking thing that nobody wants. Or this is an amazing thing, but I literally can't get any copies of it for another year and a half because the manufacturer is backed up. And then maybe there's a, a trade embargo that's also causing issues. Yeah. And the other aspect is, is you know, maybe one of your goods are handmade, you know, like a hand oh, crocheted, yeah. you know, character kind of thing. And, you know, you only have one individual that can do that. And, you know, that, let's just say that's a female for, you know, because that's, you know, generally who crochets there are males that do it but not not a whole lot but let's just say that she can only produce you know three a day kind of thing and you need to give her ramp up time to get up to a certain number Mm -hmm. that you expect to sell kind of thing yeah or what happens if they you know get a cold and they're out of commission for a few weeks yeah or a family emergency they can't work on it anymore Mm -hmm. you need to be Again, you have to cross your T's and dot your I's with all of this. Yeah, you on something like that, you need to try to get that stuff in advance. Mm-hmm. But you have to know where, it's, where you think it's going to go in advance because you're going to have to pay her for all of those, whether you, you sell them or not. Yep. Oh, yes. And that can easily kill your Kickstarter funding because... Mm-hmm. The manufacturer doesn't care if you broke even or you made a lot of extra money. If you sign a contract for 150,000 orders of something, you are going to pay for 150,000 orders of that. Mm -hmm. Now, what's what's often best is to not commit to any specific order, you know, size. You commit to specific pricing on a specific timeline. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, if they, if, if, uh, you want this asset and you can get, um, a hundred thousand of them in, in a week or, you know, or less, and you can get any amount in a week or less. And these are the prices that those would be, then you're like, okay, yeah, we'll go with that, you know, kind of thing, because that's what, you know, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah. you you got to be very careful on that. You, you know, it takes lots of planning, lots of mapping out, lots of number factoring, you know, and make sure that you ask for enough money to, to verify those rewards. Don't ask for, you know, like if it's going to cost you $300 to get those rewards for the mm-hmm. pe- person and, you know, it's $10, $15 to support the best game. Do not the base game, not the best game, the base game. It's, it's, you know, that's going to cost you, you know, there's, you know, the game's $15, the cost is $300. Don't charge $315 for that. Oh, uh-uh. You need and to make more money as you go up higher and higher tiers. Yep. And again, if it costs you, even if it costs $300 to manufacture, don't forget about shipping. Don't forget about tax. Mm-hmm. Don't forget about storage. These well, are all things that a lot of people don't think about until they are stuck. Well, you need to think about that at the beginning because some of these places mm-hmm. will handle 
your shipping and all that stuff for you. But when it comes and to manufacturers, storage. most yeah. likely they're just going to ship it right to you. So I hope you have, you know, the space for 50,000 jackets in your backyard. <laughs> it, it depends on who you go to, because like some yeah. of them will drop ship, you know, where you never actually see the good yourself. Mm -hmm. And there are, and this will be the final point that I do need to get going. There are places that explicitly handle logistics. There are companies mm -hmm. that will do that service for you. Basically, all you need to do is just say, okay, these are the goods I'm sending you. These are where they go. And they will handle the rest for you. And some manufacturers have logistics built into theirs, yes. depending on where you go. Because like a lot of YouTubers use some of that for like their T-shirts and stuff like yeah, that. Teespring, I think, is a popular one. Yeah, where Teespring will, I think, you know, you can they'll, they'll print off, uh, you know, any number of them, and they'll ship them straight to the person, and you you only have to tell them basically who you're going to, you know, but. Yeah, not all products are like that and you need to be careful when you're when you're shopping around for that because you know if that's important to you you better be sure that whoever's got it is got that and if it's not important to you you better be sure that you've got the logistics nailed down to handle that stuff yourself oh yes and, and the again, storage room yeah handle it all right but with that i do need to get going so here's i guess my final wrap-up point for our talk Ultimately, there's two big things we need to understand about crowdfunding and all of this. The first one is that you need to plan ahead. You need to be able to show somebody that you have thought this through. And this is not stuff you wait until the night of your Kickstarter. This is stuff you need to be thinking the second you even consider the possibility that you might go on a Kickstarter or a crowdfunding. You And to build off of that, the second point is you need to represent yourself the best possible way. If you are doing a Kickstarter, you better make the best damn Kickstarter that you can. If you're going to be on Steam, it better be the best damn Steam store page. Mm -hmm. And if you need help, watch our, our Thursday shows. If you're doing Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, you need every funnel to be operating at 100% efficiency because you mm -hmm. never know where somebody is going to find you. Again, people have found videos of mine and articles I wrote from three to four years ago, and that's the first thing that they associate me to. And while you can't exactly, again, without having time travel, you can go back and you know magically improve all that stuff you've already done. But you want to be at the best possible version at that time. If you half-ass something, if you do something at lower quality, that the lowest quality thing that you put out is what people are going to assume you are. Mm -hmm. I think that was a good wrap-up. So, like, let's, let's get into our second part of the funnel. You know, now that you've watched the show... You know, sub to Josh's YouTube channel, sub to my YouTube channel, join my Discord, join Josh's Discord, follow, you know, us on Twitter, you know, mine's at Nexus Games LLC. Mm -hmm. A one, don't forget the one. On yeah, there. yeah, the one. Nexus Games INC one. There we go. <laughs> and Josh's? Uh, GW Boyster. And, uh, you know, Participate in our funnel, join us, and you know, we'll you know give you more great content like this. And you can, you know, also follow my game, you know, Neon Continuum, which hopefully mm -hmm. is going to be the next big thing. And uh, you know, and maybe I'll be the next big YouTuber, I'll be the next ninja. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to get good at Fortnite first, yeah, and, and your again, YouTuber reactions. You never know where somebody's going to find you. So you want that content to be the best. And I hope everyone enjoys the stuff that I do two years ago, three years in the future. You know, my amazing fourth book and my hopefully amazing third book that's coming out really soon. Yeah, and hopefully we delivered on a really good podcast today. One that uh, is the best quality we can make. 
Yeah. And we will be back next Sunday around 4, 430. And again, our Thursday shows are at 3 to 330 as a start time. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that said, everyone, have a great uh, pie day. Everyone get some pie of any kind. At least it's 3.14. And come back for daily discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where he's in the art and science of games. Until next time, everybody, take care. Have a happy pie day. See ya. Mm-hmm. <laughs>